So the subsequent test takes up with this topic, which is obviously management of chronic renal failure. And this is one of the more common diseases you'll manage in geriatric animals. And the good news is in a lot of these animals, you can provide months to years of pretty good quality life uh, if you manage the diet and the associated sequelae that we have to deal with. Diet is the single biggest thing in managing chronic kidney failure slash chronic renal failure in terms of improving the quality of life and survival. <coughs> so you have um, typically commercial diets. Owners can make their own diets, but they're really problematic. There are issues with uh, inadequate nutrients sometimes these sorts of things. So most people opt for the commercial uh, kidney diets. Nearly all of the uh, prescription diet companies offer these. And they were the original diet that came out that started the whole therapeutic diet trend, Hills um, KD. As you can see, uh, they're lower in protein. Uh, protein is one of the major sources of the nitrogenous waste products. So we lower the protein, high quality protein, but lower protein. Uh, chronic renal failures tend to have uh, renal secondary hypoparathyroidism, uh, so they tend toward high phosphorus, so we want a diet that's low in phosphorus, and typically low in sodium. Now, of the three, the sodium is the, I hate to say the least important, but there's the least evidence that it has an impact. Surprisingly, to me at least, uh, sodium does not have as big an influence on hypertension in dogs as it does in man. <laughs> so uh, all of these are lower in sodium, and this is part of the reason we'll use it in heart failure patients as well. If they won't eat the heart diet, uh, CD sorts of products because of poor palatability, those are ultra low in sodium, then KD is something that you can offer them. Now they include other things very commonly. One is increased potassium. As a general rule, while acute renal failures tend to be hyperkalemic, chronic renal failures tend to be hypokalemic. Now there are always exceptions, but in general we're, we wind up wanting extra potassium in the diet and oftentimes we have to supplement beyond that. Uh, a lot of these include omega-3 fatty acids as a general antioxidant, uh, B vitamins, I'm not sure how much is warranted there, fat content. But a lot of these animals tend to have a uh, mild to moderate metabolic acidosis when they're in chronic renal failure, especially when they're decompensating. So we tend to have these diets be a little bit on the alkalizing side. Now palatability, uh, can be an issue on some of these, again, primarily from the sodium content. So some internists, if they, the animal won't take the renal diet, they'll go to like a uh, senior diet, but include phosphate binding agents into the diet, and we'll talk about those in just a minute if they are needed. And uh, sometimes uh, if you transition from their regular diet to the renal diet slowly, they may accept it a little better than with an abrupt change. <laughs> Other things to do that aimed at decreasing the uremia are probiotics. I've alluded to some of these before. There were three on the market. I think I mistakenly said Azadil was removed by the FDA. It was actually Renovast that was removed um, because the company was making therapeutic claims uh, for a nutraceutical compound way beyond anything that was allowed. But they still make a almost identical product, uh, Aminovast, which is still on the market. And then we have a separate company marketing Azadil. Now, Aminovast is a proprietary 
group or of amino acids and peptides that the company claims slows kidney injury. It's extremely hard to test proprietary compounds when they won't tell you what's in it. It's hard to do independent research as to how effective it is. I could only find one study that addressed it and at the time that it was going, uh, they gave it this code name, but it's basically aminovast. And I found it very interesting in reading this. It said sample population means of creatinine, BUN, hematocrit, phosphorus, and specific gravity showed no, statistic, no statistical significant change from study start to finish. And then they turn around and say it can be a valuable tool in treating and halting the progression of chronic renal failure. Uh, <coughs> really, from my viewpoint, uh, they added so many fudge factors in their description um, and not to mention they also get their grammar right wrong. This is a, uh, they're using an adjective as a noun, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but but uh, I, I can't say I'm overly impressed with the data supporting this. Now, uh, I learned a new word. I'd always been calling uh, azadil a probiotic and a probiotic is, is typically a, a, a group or uh, of microorganisms included in the diet to enhance health, okay? I was not familiar with a prebiotic. A prebiotic is something added to the diet to promote intestinal health, but not a, an uh, actual living organism. Uh, for example, in certain instances, fiber as a constituent to the diet would be considered a prebiotic. Not always, but sometimes. So it kind of sets the environment in the GI tract up for a more healthy uh, bacterial uh, <clears throat> environment and uh, healthier bacterial colonization. And you put the two together and that evidently is called a symbiotic. And that's what azadil technically evidently is referred to. And it's termed an enteric dialysis, that's the company's uh, phraseology. It's aimed at reducing azotemia by selecting for bacteria that promote intraluminal nitrogen utilization and reduce colonic absorption. So again, we're trying to decrease the absorption of uh, nitrogen waste products uh, into the body and therefore minimize the uremia. I only found two products or two studies that really address it. There are, the company, if you go to the website, will have various in vitro studies and some small things and a lot of testimonial data, but hard data is hard to come by. There were two things I found. This one was out of inter, uh, feline medicine where they tried it and it failed to alter the azotemia in cats with chronic renal failure when sprinkled onto the food. Now I have to admit that that's not the directions from the company. The azadil product says to give the tablets intact. Uh, I'm not sure if that is uh, to protect them as they travel so less are killed in the upper GI tract by the acid so more reach the colon. So uh, the, the rationale for this group of investigators is most feline owners are going to want to sprinkle a powder or a slurry on the food rather than trying to peel the cat multiple times a day. And in this case, it failed. The only other thing I found was a human study that looked at a similar product and the main outcome uh, included a significant reduction in BUN and enhanced well-being. So I took a little further look at this, okay, and here are the results. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the placebo, the control creatinine in these humans was 4.7, the control BUN was 72, and this represents the change of the um, uh, azadil type diet versus placebo. Now these are in millimoles because it was done in Germany, so I had to uh, 
uh, do some unit conversion so you could tell. In the case of creatinine, uh, this twi minus 25.5 amounted to about a 0.3 milligram per deciliter reduction. So you go from 4.7 uh, to 4.4 as your creatinine. And in the case of BUN, it's about a six point reduction. So you go from 72 to about 66. <coughs> kind of my thought is obviously it was a statistically significant reduction, meaning it was consistent. Most of the animals, or in this case humans, I should say, did have a consistent reduction in their BUN and creatinine. <coughs> but to what degree is a reduction in creatinine from 4.7 to 4.4 uh, clinically significant? Or a reduction in the BUN from 72 to 66, is that really clinically significant? So it seems that it has an effect. I would just question whether or not we're making that much difference in the clinical uh, outcome or the um, clinical signs that the animal uh, has associated with uremia. So uh, once again, you see, uh, again, my bias is a little against um, nutraceuticals. Other things we do, one of the things, especially later in the course of uh, chronic renal failure is we deal with cyclic dehydration. And the animals will be compensated and eating and drinking. And then they don't quite take in enough water so the BUN and creatinine start to rise and they get uremic. And then they don't drink enough water more so and they get more dehydrated and the uremia rises. One of the things that uh, you will do for these animals, dogs, but especially cats benefit from subcutaneous fluid administration, okay? Um, <clears throat> cats tolerate it better than dogs. You can do dogs, but cats is, is really where it works best. And you can see here the cat getting the sub-Q fluids from a needle. Uh, <clears throat> but this requires typically bringing the animal into the clinic. So what you would see is the, the cat would be nice and healthy, then it goes downhill, so the owner brings it in, and you, you give it either IV fluids in the clinic uh, or sub-Q, kind of fluid diurese it to flush uh, the uremia out in the remain, through the remaining nephrons that it has. They get non-uremic, they're still azotemic, but they're not uremic. So they start eating and drinking again and they go home. And this is a cyclic pattern. So you can, with your better clients, teach them to do subcutaneous fluids at home, okay? And sometimes this is done with needles, okay? You can see the cat being distracted with a little food up there. Uh, another option that has gained some popularity is to put in subcutaneous catheters. Uh, here we see two types. This is one, you can see the multiple ports along it. This is surgically placed with uh, the exit port coming out through the skin, typically between the shoulder blades. Uh, here's another little variation of it called a button um, uh, fluid catheter. And that's all it is, it's a silicone port uh, that you take a uh, skin biopsy hole punch and just punch a hole in the skin and this clips in through the skin and you have a special, what's called a Huber needle uh, that you use to inject through that silicone port. A Huber needle basically is made so it doesn't core or cut the silicone diaphragm as much. It kind of pushes through it rather than slicing it. Uh, now, the, the, uh, the advantage of, of it is this is really easy to do compared to this, uh, but you're not spreading it out over uh, a large area, so you may have to put in multiple uh, button catheters uh, or button ports if you do this. The biggest problem with all of these is um, infection. It takes a diligent owner to uh, manage these so that they don't become uh, infected. That's the, uh, 
greatest drawback to the subcutaneous catheters are uh, infection at the exit site. Okay. Now it can be done. I had a colleague, Dr. Wilkerson, uh, <coughs> who was a lab animal vet, uh, vet who had her own pet cat named Fish. Uh, I don't know why <laughs> a lab vet had Fish, but anyway. Uh, but um, she managed fish for probably three or four years with the subcutaneous fluid uh, port. But she was super aseptic. I mean, she scrubbed the area. She put on sterile gloves before she infused the fluid. She was really diligent, and she didn't have any problems. Uh, I think she had to replace the catheter maybe once uh, after a couple of years. So it can be done, but sepsis uh, at the exit part uh, is the biggest problem. Uh, things I've already addressed in chronic renal failure under the cardiovascular system, we talked about hypertension and again amlodipine, first choice in the cat, add an ACE inhibitor if it doesn't respond. Current thinking in the dog is try an ACE inhibitor first and then add amlodipine if that doesn't respond. Uh, proteinuria, we're talking protein losing nephropathy. We use an ACE inhibitor. If they're in renal disease, probably benazapril has an advantage over enalapril because uh, it's not eliminated by the kidney to the same degree as enalapril is. All right, other things to deal with. <coughs> We mentioned that these have um, typically renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. They have high serum phosphorus. And the higher the serum phosphorus, the worse the prognosis. Not only does it relate to prognosis, but high serum phosphorus and high serum parathyroid hormone may actually contribute to the nephrotoxicity. So we feed the diet that's low in phosphorus to start with, but we'll also typically, when we see this problem occurring, when the phosphorus starts to creep up, then we add a phosphate binder. And this is not squirted into the mouth of the cat or the dog. This is mixed with the food. They're getting the phosphate from the food, so you have to have the binder mixed into the food so that um, it won't be absorbed. Here's a list of various phosphate binders. Uh, you don't have to know these by any means. Uh, I just want you to know aluminum uh, hydroxide, uh, which is alternogel. It's an antacid you can get over the counter. That's the most common one. We sometimes run into palatability issues with the food when we mix it uh, with it, though. So you may want to try some of the other phosphate binders if that becomes a problem. Now along with that renal secondary hyperparathyroidism, we tend to get low blood calcium. Okay, <coughs> so uh, we have to try to get the calcium up and we do that uh, with calcitriol. Again, the underlying problem here is that the Dietary vitamin D is not active until it's converted by the kidney to the active form. And I shouldn't really even say the active form at that point. Technically, uh, the calcitriol has to be activated by parathyroid hormone to get to the final active form of vitamin D. But that latter problem is not an issue here. You got plenty of parathyroid hormone. So we give calcitriol uh, to try to bring up that. Uh, the, it usually has to be compounded because the small size of the animal compared to human. And the compounding vehicle does affect the stability. So you need to use a reputable pharmacist who's uh, made this before. Uh, <clears throat> it's recommended to give calcitriol on an empty stomach away from a meal. A lot of people do this at bedtime for that reason. And that's because you can get transient spikes in serum calcium from the effect of the calcitriol. <coughs> and if you happen to draw a blood sample, you get the calcitriol with food. Or actually, also, we, you might have noticed on that other slide, we sometimes give calcium hydroxide or Tums types of antacids. 
with those. That's nice not only as a phosphate binder, but it adds calcium to the diet, but you don't want to give it simultaneously with the calcitriol. You'll get these calcium spikes, and if you, if you sample the serum calcium right around that time, you'll be mistakenly led to believe they're hypercalcemic or they're normal when in fact they're not. All right, so we avoid the timing issue. One of the things that we, you have to be careful of is that if you raise the calcium uh, when there's a lot of phosphorus, phosphate in the body, there is a concern that you'll get metastatic calcification. And metastatic calcification is where normal tissues become calcified, okay? <clears throat> the typical um, dogma is that if you multiply the calcium times the phosphorus, and these are both in milligrams per deciliter, you get a calcium phosphorus product. And <clears throat> when it's uh, above 70, and you'll see authors, some say 60, some say 80, but when you get it above that, you're at greater risk of metastatic calcification. So we try to lower the phosphorus. If that's the case, we try to lower the phosphorus before we start adding the calcitriol if we can to avoid uh, metastatic calcification. Now this dogma has been questioned uh, how well the calcium phosphorus really predicts the risk of metastatic calcification. Uh, so some people, that's part of why you see different values, but the, the take home is that if you have high phosphorus levels, you want to be cautious. Usually you want to lower those before you start supplementing uh, the vitamin D to raise the calcium, unless they're really, really hypocalcemic. Well, of course, um, the kidney is also responsible for the conversion of erythropoietin, so uh, these animals also tend to get anemic. We used to, uh, well, truthfully we didn't have anything for a long time. What I was about to say is we used to use anabolic steroids to try to boost the, the PCV in these animals. The idea was as an anabolic it was uh, um, <coughs> tended to promote bone marrow uh, responsiveness and this sort of thing. Truthfully, it didn't work with the flip. It was something to try. Now we use uh, the human recombinant erythropoietin. Okay, and there are uh, two two formulations. Epipoietin was the original. It's largely been replaced by darbopoietin, which has the longer half-life and is less antigenic. Uh, and we're trying to target uh, a PCV above 25, get it somewhere above 25 to, to 35. We have problems with this though. One of the biggest problems is they develop antibody. This is human recombinant erythropoietin, not dog or cat erythropoietin. And there are enough differences that it's antigenically dissimilar and they, they develop antibodies. Now there are two implications of that. The, the biggest thing is it may stop working after a while. Uh, the antibodies are neutralizing it, okay? The more severe thing is the antibodies start cross-reacting with what little erythropoietin the animal is already making, and then you wind up with a uh, pure red blood cell aplasia of the bone marrow. So that's a more serious uh, consequence. Oddly, you wouldn't think it with, with uh, uh, something like a erythropoietin, but a lot of these animals, particularly cats, get hypertensive. Turns out erythropoietin is somewhat of a vasoconstrictor. So uh, hypertension can be a problem. And we don't know why, but with darbopoietin, uh, not an insignificant number had seizures. Uh, there are hypotheses that it's altering viscosity and causing uh, TIAs and that sort of thing. But we really don't know why, as far as I know, that they developed this. But uh, because of this, we don't jump on board with the erythropoietin right off hand. If you know a, a, a family member or a friend who has kidney failure, 
and they start getting anemic, they get down into the 30s, uh, low 30s, that sort of thing. They just jump on erythropoietin and off they go and they do just fine. But because of the antibody production and the side effects, we hold off until they're more severe. So we're looking for advanced kidney disease with hermetocrits less than 22. And it's not uncommon really to see veterinarians wait until they're in the low teens before we add erythropoietin uh, for that reason. And also that they're having problems. Uh, a chronic anemia, the body can compensate to some degree much more than with an acute anemia. So you, you have the, the cat with an acute anemia of 18 and the cat with a chronic anemia of 18 and the acute uh, anemia cat will be dyspneic and struggling and the chronic anemia is just walking around like everything's fine. So we look at clinical signs as well as the PCV in terms of when we, uh, how we deal with this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of interesting. I wouldn't have thought this right offhand, but iron supplementation is usually recommended. Iron supplementation more commonly is only used when we have blood loss. And certainly some of these animals will get uremic uh, gastritis and uremic GI ulcers and bleed, and they certainly need iron supplementation. But it appears that a lot of these animals that are on erythropoietin do get a better response if you supplement their iron, okay? Uh, and some people just routinely do it. Uh, the authors usually recommend you run iron panels where you're looking at total iron and iron binding capacity to see if they really need it. Uh, you can give iron in two ways. You can give it parenterally, and that's iron dextran given IM. Uh, this is what we give to the baby piglets to prevent iron deficiency. You know, uh, baby pigs in nature get their iron from rooting and eating dirt and all this sort of thing. But in confinement operations, that can't occur, so we give them iron dextrin. Uh, you can give this to any animal. There are two problems. There is an unusually high incidence of an anaphylactoid reaction. We don't know why. And Anaphylactoid, if you're not familiar with the term, is like anaphylaxis. In anaphylaxis, we know what it is. We know it's an IgE-mediated uh, event. Anaphylactoid looks like anaphylaxis, but we're not really sure if it's IgE. It probably is, but we're not sure. The thinking on this is it's the dextran part that somehow they've uh, developed an antigenic sensitivity to it and so they'll respond. So my advice if you give this is to monitor them for the first 30 minutes after administration and make sure you're not uh, causing problems. Uh, <coughs> you can get iron overload, which I'll mention next. Oral irons are more, uh, are safer than parenteral uh, irons, but they can cause more GI irritation uh, as well, and they tend to turn the stool black. So now there are two things that turn stool black that you know of that are not melanin. Pepto-Bismol is one, iron supplements are another, all right? So bear those in mind. And I wanna point out that iron is not benign, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, in children, one of the common toxicities is iron toxicity from uh, ingestion of um, pediatric multivitamins. So you got your Flintstone chewables, they're fine, you know, gummy bears, whatever, until the child eats the whole bottle, all right? And it's mostly the iron that the physicians are worried about. Uh, in low doses, that meets their requirements, a whole bottle, they'll wind up with iron toxicity. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, systemic, you, you get a, the, the GI signs orally, but you've got all these systemic signs as well. Impaired oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondrial injury, cellular death, hypotension, metabolic acidosis, coagulopathy. Um, <clears throat> remember that the body doesn't have a 
elimination process for iron that is uh, dose or concentration dependent. What regulation the body has on iron is by absorption from the GI tract. It can't enhance its renal elimination. It can't enhance its uh, liver elimination. If the iron gets in the body, it's there, okay? And it's just going to take a certain amount if you don't intervene to get rid of it. It goes through their, their different ways. It has to do with sloughing of the enterocytes that carry some of the iron away and this sort of thing. If you get into an accidental iron overdose, we do have an antidote. It's a, it's a chelating agent. So just like you give a calcium EDTA for a lead poisoning, you can give uh, the deferoxamine for an iron uh, poisoning. Yes? No, you would treat the anaphylactoid reaction just like you would anaphylaxis. Um, th this is more for the cellular toxicity. Okay. Uremic gastroenteritis is also a common thing when they're in the, the uremic episodes. Uh, and it's pretty self-explanatory, inappetence, nausea, vomiting, stomatitis, GI ulceration, diarrhea. Um, and it's symptomatic. <coughs> Largely we use antiemetics to stop the vomiting and we use gastroprotectants uh, to, uh, to decrease stomach acid and um, coat the, the, uh, the GI tract. And we'll talk about those when I cover gastric uh, agents. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of these animals tend to be in a state of metabolic acidosis mild, generally, moderate when they go into the uremic crises. And here are your goals uh, and in terms of what you're trying to maintain. Now, the, uh, the renal diets I mentioned already are trying to alkalize to compensate for this, but in some of these animals, uh, you check their bicarb. You can't do a bicarb, you can run the uh, total PCO2, that will give you a uh, indirect measure of bicarb uh, that you'll get off just a regular serum chemistry. And when uh, we need to, you can give sodium bicarb orally. Sometimes it's uh, not all that palatable. So more commonly, people will give potassium citrate, uh, which has the advantage of also providing potassium. Yes? Yeah, in, in any form of acidosis, whether it's respiratory or, or, well, really in respiratory, the problem is that they're not able to blow it off. So they're already hypoventilating in respiratory acidosis. But in metabolic acidosis, yes, you will see the respiratory rate increase in an effort to blow that off. But whether or not it'll be conspicuous enough to notice it is another thing. And lastly, I mentioned that while in acute renal failures, hyperkalemia is more common and chronic renal failures, low serum potassium is more common. And that's defined as anything less than 3.5. Um, I've seen them down to two, that's pretty bad. 1.5 is really, really, really bad. Uh, you'll see muscle weakness primarily uh, they'll have a ventriflexion, they can't hold their head up, they kind of have their head down like that, and what's called a plantigrade stance, where their hocks are dropped, their hocks are down on the floor. Now, that's not the only place you'll see that. You'll see that also with diabetic neuropathy from the nerve injury. But uh, that's one of the signs in more severe hypokalemia. You can give intravenous potassium supplements uh, if they're hospitalized. Um, the standard dogma is that for IV potassium, you don't want to give it any faster than a half milli equivalent per kilogram per hour. Now, if we get to it, I have an electrolyte lecture, we can push that a lot more than that if you're willing to monitor the ECG. But we would rather do this orally. 
Uh, orally, they handle it a lot better. It's a lot safer, fewer uh, side effects with the heart, that sort of thing. So we'd rather have oral uh, potassium supplement. And again, there, there are two uh, primary products, uh, potassium gluconate um, or potassium citrate. Uh, really, the gluconate should also uh, cause some alkalosis, but it seems to be the citrate that uh, uh, gets most of the press in that regard. All right, I think that's the last slide. Is, is that any questions? <laughs>